Hi, my name is uh, Craig Resnick with the ARC Advisory Group. Uh, thanks for uh, joining us today. Uh, we'd like to have you welcome you to our webinar, uh, Data Engineering for Industrial Analytics, uh, Setting the Stage for Success. You know, I think one of the reasons we're uh, excited about it is we're all, you know, tackling a lot of these new analytics pro uh, projects, and we know how common it is to kind of focus on that end result, you know, which is like anticipating the operational insights that you're trying to gain as a result of the project and hopefully the money that you'll get to save as a result of the project. But really before you can build that new real-time production dashboard or predictive quality model, you know, there's something you need to have sorted out first and, and that's the data. So today we'll have a discussion about data engineering. We'll talk about like the crucial first step that's really required for successful digital transformation of uh, any sort of industrial analytics project. You know, so we'll talk about things like strategies for centralizing data and data warehouses versus data lakes and how to add meaningful content to data and uh, how to prepare data for consumption to different audiences. And, um, you know, with that, what we have is we have two uh, special guests today. We have uh, Kevin Jones, who's the Director of Sales and Marketing from DataPak. Uh, welcome, welcome, Kevin. Hey, thank you, Craig. Good to be here. Excellent. And we have Bronco Radulovic, and he's an MAS engineer from uh, BA Consultants. How are you today, Bronco? Very good. Thank you. Nice to be here. Thank you for the invite. Excellent. Excellent. You know, one of the things we wanted to talk about was, you know, when, when we put this webinar together, um, and uh, Kevin had told me uh, he wanted to invite BBA, and uh, hey, Kevin, could you just tell us a little bit about, you know, why, uh, why BBA? Why did you invite BBA to this webinar? Yeah, Craig. So, you know, when we're, you know, as a software vendor working oftentimes with system integrators and other, uh, other partners to do the services side, uh, you know, we're always looking for partners that know the space. You know, as, as we were chatting before this webinar, you know, um, talking about companies who know the industrial space, know the software platforms, and, and that's BBA. I mean, they, they're, they know the industry, which is great. Um, where that's not always, you know, always the case. Uh, but the other thing is really their approach to projects. Um, you know, we, we have a very, I'd say, um, you know, practical approach and trying to solve problems both, you know, for today and also problems for tomorrow. And, uh, and BBA has uh, a very, um, I'd say, you know, um, regimented, um, you know, approach to projects. Um, and I think they do it the right way. So, um, you know, that's why we brought Branko and maybe, you know, Branko can say a few words about that. Yeah, Great. yeah definitely. Uh, so uh, first of all, for those of you that don't know BBA, the letters basically stand for uh, Breton, Banville and Associates. So those are the two smart guys that founded our company, uh, very highly skilled engineers back in 1980. So company has been running strong for uh, 40 plus years. So we cover the Canadian market, especially. Uh, we have over a thousand uh, employees and we specialize uh, in, um, in industries such as uh, mine and metals, uh, renewables, uh, biofuels, uh, manufacturing as well. So we do a lot of cool and interesting projects uh, that involve data, right? So in our mission, we have uh, our three pillars and that's something that we work with Kevin as well. Also when they offer it for their customers is to try to work in that methodology. So. Uh, basically, the three pillars are very simple. The first one is the data engineering. So we do a lot of work around the data, how we structure it, present it. But once you have that data, what do you do with it? So the important thing is to find value in it. So the whole valorization aspect. And then finally, we do smart analytics. So everything that has to do with um, resolving the problems uh, around complex um, issues that the customers might have, whether it be an equipment uh, malfunctioning, predicting quality, predicting um, uh, estimates, for example, for drilling different sites. So that's kind of what we do. Well, that's, uh, that's really fascinating. <laughs> and, I, and I bet one of the things that you probably get involved with is having a discussion with the customers as far as kind of like what percentage of a project should be allocated to the data engineering phase. And, and because of that, one of the things I want to do is I want to see if we can get our our, our listeners to uh, look, respond to a poll question. And we like to ask them just that, which is, uh, which is the percentage of the project that they may consider allocating to data engineering. 
uh, and pick between zero or less than 20% or 20 to 40% and over 40%. And, and one of the things that I'll do while we're, while we're waiting for some answers is I'll go back to Kevin. Um, if you were answering this question for a majority of your data park customers, what, what do you, what would you guess they would pick? And then I'll ask uh, Bronco the same question. Well, I, uh, I think maybe you create two different answers there. Uh, what I guess they'll pick and, and what, Right, what the really looks like. Exactly. Um, we'll, hear it now. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll see here. But yeah. and, and typically, from our experience, you know, twenty to forty percent uh, is where we would we would see it. Uh, you know, in our you know, on our smaller projects, uh, ends up actually being a, a larger percentage of the data engineering. Because uh, one of the things we do in like a, a you know base pr uh, project is to get you know basically all the links to the data, all the underlying foundation in place, and then you know teach our customers to fish and really empower them with the easy to use tools. And so that that requires that you know fundamental foundation of data engineering to make it easy. Uh, and so they you know the smaller the project, oftentimes the higher the percentage. Mm -hmm. okay. Interesting. Go ahead, Bronco. Do we do we have the results or uh, yeah? Well, for, for my for my. Uh, I think I would say maybe around 20% at least, because just to make sure that we are aligned on the strategy. So it's super easy now these days to download a software, you know, start configuring on your own, maybe go on YouTube a little bit, you know, see how it's done, right? And then start uh, delivering something, you know, but that's one way of doing things. But I think the smart way would be just to sit down, you know, get all the required people in the room and just talk about what is the final business value that we're trying to deliver, right? So how do we do that? Um, uh, one thing that we've been putting in place is that RASI chart, matrix charts, uh, matrix. So basically um, uh, putting the, uh, assigning people, you know, who's gonna be responsible, who's gonna be accountable, who should we like consider consult and then inform. So I guess that's kind of like a frame, work frame that we propose and then we get into a workshop. So that's how we start off this journey, I would say. No, oh, that's, that, that, that's great. Now, now let's, let's see if we have any results yet so we can see okay. how uh, uh, That's exactly what I, I certainly would have predicted. I would have predicted, uh, you know, either in that 20% range as you, as you need Bronco. Any, and so no, no surprises, Bronco or Kevin? Uh, we're in a good track. <laughs> yeah, that, I, I'd say uh, it, it's good to see. Um, I think the, the right recognition of what's what's needed. Um, yeah, and there's more and more tools these days now for um, you know for the for the data insights. So depending, it's really what you want to solve because yeah. it, it's just something that you will use to support the bigger picture, right? Yeah, and, and yeah. certainly you know from the. Uh, you know, kind of the software vendors perspective, you know, we've, we've been doing this for about 20 years now and, and really tried to make data engineering part of the software product to make that, that phase as easy as possible. You know, certainly what Branko is talking about and, and getting the workshops and the people has to happen, but if we can make with the software, make it easy to connect to, you know, multiple data sources, make it easy to do the right, you know, data aggregation, data filtering, uh, contextualization, um, then we can make that at least as easy as possible once you get into, you know, building out that foundation. And uh, that's been a real focus of ours from the beginning. Yeah, no, exactly. You guys have certainly done a, a great job of that o o over the years, Kevin. You know, just to make sure that we want to make sure that all the listeners are kind of at a level set. Uh, now I'll probably start with Bronco. Is how do you define data engineering and explain uh, why is that important? And then we'll go to Kevin for his follow-up. Well, first of all, again, like building that roadmap, for me, that's super important when we start our projects. So once we have the, the people uh, that are expressing a need or they have a problem, so we want to make sure that we get them into the, uh, the same room, we we'll get off a, a workshop. And the data engineering starts with, let's say, working on, an, let's say, a, a system architecture, right? Where is this data going to come from? Do we have the necessary... Um, um, drivers to extract that data, pass it along? Do we need to manipulate it? Do we need approvals for that data? Uh, who's gonna be uh, managing the security? 
So uh, all that, the legal part, where's the data going to be stored? If we store it in a cloud, is this cloud public? Is it private? Uh, so there's uh, there's a lot of uh, questions to be, uh, you know, kind of resolved, answered. Mm -hmm. And obviously um, determining what the, um, uh, what are the consequences of the problems that we have? So we can put, try to estimate the return on investments. Okay. Mm -hmm. Engineering is also delivering uh, helping us get that ROI. So because yeah. we hire people, for example, a, a team is a data scientist. So you'll need to have somebody to analyze the data that was passed to you and then deliver the, uh, solve the problem. Ultimately with that. Yeah, and certainly the ROI is of critical importance. Uh, do you see anything uh, similar, Kevin, or is anything different with any of your customers? Yeah, no, I think, you know, certainly similar. I, but I think what's really important about the, the, the data engineering side is if you get that right, you really future proof your, your solution uh, going forward. You know, oftentimes, you know, a customer comes in with a specific problem, a specific goal, and that's what the project's kind of based around. Uh, and it's really easy to get kind of tunnel vision and just to solve that one problem. But if we get, you know, the data engineering right, not only do we solve that problem, mm -hmm. but we solve a problem they're going to have in two weeks, they don't even know they have. Uh, I can think of several examples with customers where, you know, maybe you mentioned, you know, um, you know, a quality um, uh, model that, you know, really they're, you know, they're concerned about controlling one of their quality parameters. You know, it's got it's too much variation causing issues and they want to reduce that variation of their you know, the, you know, final product quality. Uh, but, you know, we get the data engineering right in the beginning and then, you know, they, they tackle that, but, you know, in six weeks, Maybe they're actually having some operational issues on the machine, on the, you know, on the plant. Well, we have all the data set up right. They can now solve that problem too. Um, so I think that's you know one of the huge advantages. It gets you set up for future success. You know the mm -hmm. the problems you don't know you're going to have, but you're going to have them. Yeah, absolutely. And it, and it's funny because we talk to some of our clients. Let's say that they're in artificial intelligence using cloud-based solutions and. And sometimes we'll hear things like just dump all the data in one place and we'll sort it out. You know, just just keep filling up that data lake, shall we say. From Datapox perspective, you know, does that represent a different approach than you would take? And then I'll ask Bronco to comment on that as well. So um, I would say yes and no. Um, certainly yes in that we want to have access to all the data um, with the tool set. And, and so that, you know, again, it gets into you know, solving problems you don't know you need to have. But when it comes to like, I'd say the advanced analytics um, side of things, um, it, it's different. You know, I think we try to look when we're doing advanced analytics, try to be a little bit more um, tailored, a little bit more curated with, with our modeling. Uh, we've, we've done some R&D with, you know, some unsupervised modeling techniques, which, you know, is that give us the 5,000 tags related to your asset and um, you know, we'll, we'll figure out what relationships are and the models can do an okay job with that. But what you end up with a lot of times is, you know, you know, the old, the old, old truths, you know, don't go away. Correlation is not always causation. Sure. And just because you've got a, an accurate model, uh, from when you built it, doesn't mean you have a robust model and in industrial manufacturing, you're much better off having, you know, lower accuracy but more robustness as the process changes than you are having a very accurate model that doesn't work when anything changes in the plant. Um, and that's where like the, you know, the subject matter experts come into play that still have to make those, those, you know, those calls. Those, those are you know, decisions to be made. And um, so we found better success when you can marry, you know, really good software tools with the people in the plant who know the process and, um, and can, can put that sort of, um, uh, sanity check to it. Yeah. Do you, would you say the same, Bronco? Well, for me, I see it as a broad subject. You know, we, we get uh, to the data lakes and the data warehouses. So it kind of gets, uh, I don't know if it's confusing or, or it became just like a, a given, you know, put it there. But what's important to understand, I think, is what's included in the data lake or how do we got there, you know, from, uh, from let's say, uh, when we started uh, this, when a, when a plant starts in these operations, they have an application that runs their business. So what's behind that is a database or a, 
multiple databases. Mm -hmm. So those are operational databases and they, they sustain the business. So you have rows and columns and, and you're able to, to work with that. But then as the maturity of your uh, operation grows, then somebody's going to say, hey, we need a data, data warehouse. Oh, okay, well, why can't we just use our smart analytics on the, the operational database we have? Well, you'll have somebody that's going to create a report on the side, you know, configure it, you know, it might work right away, but then you will impact the production because that's the database you're hitting and you're trying to do analytics and you're your data analytics on that uh, operational database. And that's not the right way to do it. So then we have a data warehouses that extract and often terms you'll hear uh, an acronym ETL, which stands for extract, transform and uh, load the data. So that's done periodically. And then we take the data out of there, put it in a data warehouse and do aggregations, slicing and time periods. So. The advantages there is you can have a different group of people doing reports and getting operational insights and not affecting the productions. So I think that's one thing. And then we have the data lake, which is another concept. So the that's the AI part of things. So yeah. actually in the data warehouse, you need to be structured, right? So mm -hmm. call this a, a structured data interactions. And when we get to the data lake, well, it's a mixture of data, databases, files, uh, could be even images, uh, videos. So this is where you kind of have um, a free for all, so, right? You have a, a unstructured data and structured data. And how do you make sense of that? So if you decided to have that without going through the regular uh, roadmap, if you want to call it, database, data warehouse, data links. So it could be a little bit challenging for you. Because um, yeah. you do reporting there, but you're kind of getting into a uncharted territory. Uh, I kind of see it, you know, like a lake, you need a boat. Right. <laughs> the boat, you'll have somebody that operates the boat and feeds the, the intel to the guy, you know, steering. So mm -hmm. uh, I have an analogy for that. So <laughs> you have the data engineer, you know, who's giving, feeding the data scientist mm -hmm. and steering the boat, right? Because to get to that final destination, which is your uh, uh, business uh, value, right? So, uh, but you're getting, you're getting information from all sources. It could be like a Twitter feed, right. uh, somebody that's getting, uh, let's say uh, they're doing a product reviews and they want to speculate sales. Well, they want to mix that Twitter feed data from, uh, you know, what, what, what are they seeing on a, on the market so that's data and data if you don't put it in context it's not worth much so that's uh, that's, that's, a, that's that's for sure well, yeah i wonder i wonder too frankly uh, it's kind of got me thinking that you know if you kind of jump right to that you know data lake with the structured and unstructured data i mean do you think your customers would also like miss some value along that way because there's certainly value at every every step in that chain yeah and for the value, you know, you can identify values at a very early steps, right? You don't need to have a data lake to have value. So maybe there's something in your little application database that could be done. If not, okay, well, we'll see if we're going to spin out a, a SQL server with a data warehouse analytics. Uh, maybe we'll just stop there and that's it for now. This is good for us. Our sales team is able to work with that. They're getting all the information on monthly reports, yearly reports. They're... And that data also gets, you know, updated, right? So yeah. if you're jumping into the data lakes, then that's, uh, that's where you also need to have a data scientist. Uh, if we define, for example, what a data scientist does, what are the qualifications? So they have to like math, they have to like... We'll, we'll talk about the modeling, we'll talk about the model uh, accuracy, and there's a lot of stats in the back. And also, um, in terms of the programming languages, there's the Python, right? So the Python is a very commonly spread mm -hmm. language uh, that is used. You can import different uh, libraries. Uh, there's a lot of development on the latest scripts. So there's a, that's a good, th th good uh, thing to have. Yeah, you know, it's funny because 
Bronco, when we're doing a lot of client projects, we get involved with all these issues of data siloing with our because customers. The, yeah, and that's it, another and thing. They, and they look at that as this really common pain point. And so we, we run into this all the time. So how do you help your customers overcome data siloing? And then I'll ask uh, Kevin for a follow-up as well from Datapox perspective. Right. Yeah, so the data silo is, is, a, is a very common thing in the industries, especially if you have um, people that are, are specific engineers that work on those single systems and they're not, uh, for example, willing to share the information and make it um, available in terms of say. And also if we wanna have uh, a, a holistic uh, overview of what's going on with it, we need to open those, break those barriers and put the data in a single, uh, well, as much as we can in the data warehouse where we're gonna be able to interact with it and keep the silos more for like the operational uh, in, uh, space. So, but definitely, um, yeah, if we could, uh, if we could uh, expose the data and then validate the security, right? Is the data good? Does the data need to be transformed? Uh, for example, if you a simple conversion of gallons, liters, uh, feet, meters. So if you take the data, you make sure you have to like put a right context to it. So that's something that we also analyze and make sure that once the data gets to the other point B, that it comes in a desired format. What about some of the tools you have, um, Kevin, from Datapox perspective to kind of help out with data siloing? Yeah, yeah, I think Craig, this is you know, one of the, we talked about you know, sort of how we bake data engineering and in, into the data park as a product. One of the, the core use cases, um, you know, plants have you know, data silos everywhere. Um, I think that the thought you know, 10, 15 years ago, maybe even five years ago, is that, you know, everything's going to end up in your, everything from an operational perspective is going to end up in your, your process of story. And then, um, companies worked hard to do that. But I think just with the explosion of data, it became really hard. Um, and so just information gets scattered, you know, on the OT, on the IT. Uh, so we, we architected data park from the beginning to be you know, agnostic of a given data source. So you can connect to multiple sources, combine that data and make it look to the end user if it all comes from one place. Uh, but it in fact is coming from, from different places. So you, you can certainly go, you know, the, the, the data warehouse route, um, which, which simplifies things and gives you a little bit more control over some of the business rules and how the data is aggregated, certainly value there. Um, but if we want to just connect, you know, sort of data where it exists today, uh, you know, we have drivers to go to your, you know, your uh, process of story and go to your lab quality system, go to your MES, you know, just kind of whatever, your ERP system, because those are your system of record and you know, places do a good job of keeping that data accurate and consistent. And so you know, just leverage it. Yeah. And, I, and I like also the fact that the data park support, supports most of the latest uh, historians. You know, you have the, uh, just to name a few, a GE, Pi, and you can also uh, connect to a Prophecy MESs um, because MES could have multiple databases everywhere. So it's kind of also representative of the uh, silos. So I think that's good in your solution that you have. Yeah, you know, just and that, those, you know, you named the kind of, uh, I'd say, most recognizable vendors, but, you know, it's it's growing in the cloud space too, you know, whether it's, you know, Microsoft Time Series Insights or, you know, something like Snowflake, um, you know, that now I, think that, I don't think that's going to slow down. Um, so, you know, if we can make sure we connect to data sources wherever they are and make that data available to users across an you know, organization, no matter where they are, uh, then we can really empower people. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's interesting because when it comes to data, another area, you know, when you talk about trying to, you know, pr identify the data and, and properly utilize the data and kind of be able to sort it out between data that becomes actionable versus data that really you shouldn't be spending any time on. So we get involved with a lot of, I would say, is, you know, applying contextualization. Um, you know, to the data. So I'll, I'll start with Bronco and then go to Kevin. You know, what, what's your take on the whole contextualizing data? And, 
and, mm -hmm. and you know, how do you add in your projects, you know, context to data and, and do you consider that part of data engineering? Yeah, definitely. Well, my expertise is mostly around MES systems, so manufacturing execution systems. And when we talk about to our customers, like the benefits of it, uh, is we try to, to explain them that this is the contextualization. So for example, if you have a batch, well, the data is aggregated, pre-aggregated already for the batch. So you have a pure product, uh, you have the different quality aspects, you might even have the operators who worked on that. So this is the, the, the goal of contextualizing the data. So you don't need to have somebody going in an Excel spreadsheet and trying to match times when they happen okay right and they extract data from one system and they copy paste that in columns in excel they try to match and the timestamps to limit okay there's a batch start batch end so the, today there's a lot of the tools like that that are already pre-made they are event based so whenever an event is created there is a start and an end time so those are the drivers to start catch, uh, fetching the data for the context and you can do so many things around that to, um, to justify your business values, right? Yeah, exactly. What you, what's your perspective, Kevin? Yeah, I mean, the, the context is everything. Um, you know, whether, you know, frankly, let me just give an example around sort of you know, event-based data, like a batch is a very classic example there. Um, but it could be even in a continuous process where you make different products. And you need to know, you know, the, the temperature of the production line is very relative to what product you're making. And so we can't just you know, look at a, a time series trend and say, is my temperature good or bad? Uh, we have to know what was being made when, and we have to know, you know, the context of where we're supposed to be, what are our limits and targets for those different, um, different you know, product types. Uh, so there's, there's lots of examples of, of contextualization uh, and even, you know, from an asset perspective, uh, you know, where, where in the plant is this information coming from so I can have some context on, uh, on the, you know, the, the sensor in the field. Yeah. And, and you know, those are all things that we've, you know, worked hard on in the product to make that, again, as easy to configure and then as easy for the user to take advantage of, of that configuration. And, uh, and, you know, certainly we still have work to do, but uh, an area of continued focus for us. But I think you know, also in that context, uh, what you guys are doing good is you have the capability to put manual data as well. So it's not just uh, getting the systems automated, they're integrated and there's APIs, but sometimes you also need a capability, a functionality per se to say, okay, I'm inputting manual data, right? And yeah. That's, that's something that's also important because to that categorization cannot be, cannot be easily achieved with some automated systems, but definitely the fact that there is that functionality, I think that's an added benefit. And uh, another thing to say, uh, for example, a data scientist that we have and they get different mandates, uh, they say, oh, can you do that? Well, they can say yes, but where's the data? What's the context? Uh, they'll start the pre-engineering work to say, okay, here's my confidence level, right? And they say, okay, we can deliver this. So if there is no context and a lot of data cleaning needs to be done, that's, it gets kind of like tougher for the data scientists to say, okay, we can, we can deliver that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, sometimes we also get into the whole area of things like performance and speed and the architecture of the data. And I know that's probably a key part of the, uh, you know, the data engineering of the project. I mean, we get into these customers that'll, you know, it's, it's like almost like if, if you're talking Bronco with MES, you know, do I, do I want an on-prem MES? Do I want a cloud-based wow. MES? But, you know, kind of like, what, what are your thoughts on performance and speed? And how do you recommend architecting the data to kind of maximize that as part of the whole data engineering phase of the project? Uh, I can go first. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, for, for us, definitely, it's a, it's a big thing. So the structuring of that has to be like laid out. Uh, performance is crucial, right? So let's say you're doing data analysis, you're doing your, your trends, you already pre-built your display, you know where you're looking for. 
and then accidentally, let's say, or something, you change the year and then you somehow you're grabbing a year's worth of data and it's like, oh no, I really hit that button. <laughs> right. This is where you're like, okay, you've reached the limit of your system and sometimes you could even um, forget what you were working on. You lose the train of thought mm -hmm. and it, you also could be impacting uh, the performances of your uh, application, right? So remember where we talked about having the operational database, yep. warehouse data lake. So if you're set up to report on the, on the operational database, then the performance is very, very crucial because depending on how you create your query, how do you do your trend, how many variables you put in the trend and different um, sampling rates, for example, if you, if you take, a, if you take a, a, a raw values versus a, let's say, for example, a lab or different sampling type averages, well, you're gonna ask more processing power from the, the server, right? And depending what kind of architecture you have in the back, well, it's gonna yield the results that you asked. So I think that's also important to consider and um, just, you know, having a, a smart systems not to, um, not to lose uh, performance and to affect your operations, right? Balance. Yeah, absolutely. What, your perspective, Kevin? I mean, I think, you know, you know Branko touched upon some of, I think, our and my key uh, beliefs, too, around, you know, you've you got to keep people engaged when they're trying to solve a problem. Uh, and with, I think, you know, with our kind of distributed workforce, especially in the last couple of years, uh, and distributed data now with, you know, on-prem data, data, um, data centers, we, we you know, this, this, this saying of, make all data perform as if it's local. Uh, you know, when back in the day when all data was on-prem and all people were on-prem, you know, we had a pretty good uh, shot at having, you know, relatively high performance, but now as everybody scatters and data scatters, that becomes a challenge. Uh, so, you know, from a data park standpoint, we've really added like a flexible architecture so that we can put different pieces of the software in different places of the whole system, try to make that data performs if it's local, even if it's not. Um, and then using some, some basically, um, we call our, our performance data engine to um, kind of pre-ID long-term data. So um, in Franco's example of the, you know, the person who actually grabbed a year of data, going to their production historian for that, they're going to um, an archive that's optimized for that long-term uh, time series data. And, uh, you know, his example was the accident, but sometimes that's intentional. You, you want to look at a year of data or you know, look at two years of data, look at some seasonality. Uh, and so to kind of be able to do that quickly and let people, you know, solve a problem in one sitting, not have to go get a cup of coffee or go ask yeah. their, 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 you know, system admin to pre-configure something for them. Really, yes. you know, it can be the difference between solving a problem and not solving it. Yeah, and I think to your point, it's testing the scenarios. Yeah. Like, what if, what if, oh, what if I add this variable? What if I add this data set? And then you kind of get like different analytics that you can use for the insights. But mm -hmm. yeah. if your system doesn't give you those quick insights, then you're kind of like, uh, as a data scientist, then you're like, oh, I can't work with this platform. Like, what is the, what is the benefit of it? So maybe you you be discouraged in your work that you're doing. So yeah, because you know how often I'm sure you've seen this, Branko. How often the, the you know the first question that you ask of the data is the last question that you ask of the data. I mean, it, it's just the beginning. You know, the, the first question usually results in five more questions. Um, mm -hmm. And so you need you need the software to be kind of flexible so you can keep asking those questions um, and not just give up, right? Um, yeah. And one thing I've, I've seen is like when we give a report to uh, another person, they look at it and then they go, oh, what if you add this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you're like, oh, I didn't think of that. Wait, let me see. Let me see. So then it's also the capacity of how fast you can adapt to provide another insight. So does it take you another week, let's say, or, uh, or a day or an hour to reprocess all that data? So performance is there too, right? So being able to um, quickly go back and re readjust your your report or the insight you have uh, provided. So, like, for example, 
the data lakes, if you're reprocessing tons of video images, for example, for detection or uh, replacing what a human can do with an eye, we, we have all these, uh, uh, we develop these protocols here, but uh, how fast can you reprocess all that data with the video, right? The performance, when will you get that uh, model updated? So that's kind of like in the same aspects of that. Yeah, and the answer, I'm sure with the videos, it's not, it doesn't happen very quickly. Right. Um, so. Yeah, a lot of bandwidth, you know, that certainly takes a lot of time. And one thing we've seen also along with the MES databases, and that's based on SQL. So SQL tables are pretty efficient in the beginning when you set them up and install them. But oftentimes we've seen that you need to have somebody doing the maintenance on them, right? So Absolutely. Like the key thing to consider, and it's part of our workshop. So once we start working with the, with the team that desires to resolve um, problems, well, we can tell them ahead, okay, this is your infrastructure. You have, a, you have a historian, you have a SQL databases. And again, talking to that RACI chart, the matrix. So we'll have a SQL uh, maintenance team. They need to be informed. This is what we're doing. This is the new sensor we're adding. This is gonna create more data. Oh, there's new events coming in. So definitely there's a lot of things to be looked at in that 20% of that pre-engineering work that we do to making sure that the performance is also kept up. In, in, in. Yeah, because it's got to sustain, right? You, you, again, you got to solve these problems, not just for today, but you know, for tomorrow and in the future. Right. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, as we're, I think probably the last question from me before we get to uh, audience Q and A, and and obviously, if there's anybody listening that has a question, uh, please go to the Q and A button on the on the bottom of the your, your screen and uh, leave us some questions, and we'll get to that. And uh, we have also some other questions uh, that people have submitted uh, ahead of time that we'll get that we'll get started with. But but if you, if you had any potting thoughts, Kevin, uh, what would you uh, what, what few points would you want the listeners to to take away from uh, from your perspective and the data pod perspective? Um, I, I'd say you know certainly recognize you know, the importance of this you know this pre-engineering phase and um, and and keep in mind the big picture because uh, that's really what what the you know the data engineering in my mind helps you going forward. You know, we can always we can always so solve a narrow problem with a narrow solution. Um, but that doesn't really get you where you want to go in the long term. And so if we, you know, we do the data engineering right, we're we're set up um, to solve problems today and tomorrow. And you know, I, you know, the the workforce is just going to get more, you know, dispersed. I think data is going to get again more dispersed with different options. And so setting yourself up for a real kind of a future proof system is is really important. Um, and and that's what you know, at Data Park, what we really want to do is you know make it easy to enable your people um, to solve problems. Okay, and Bronco? Yeah, on my end, I would say, uh, I would put it in numbers, 2080. <laughs> yeah. 20, 80. 20, 20% 20 of the work you put, uh, you know, on your pre-engineering will help you resolve a potential 80% that's, uh, that's standing up there and definitely following the, um, defining your roadmap, the strategy having the right people work with you on different projects, identifying uh, the problems that you have and consequences, because not all problems uh, yeah. could do catastrophic consequences. And, and oftentimes the management team will ask, okay, what is our return on investment in this? We are putting this solution in with this consulting services and this, uh, okay. So how do we get our return on the investment? So that's also, uh, a part of the strategy to identify the gains, right? So there's less and less workforce, there's despair, there's data siloing and, uh, and uh, all that. So all that needs to be taken into account. So in a nutshell, I would say that 2080 or 8020. <laughs> That's a great point. Yeah, That's a yeah, great yeah. Point. and I think, you know, break just the more we talk here, the more you have a firm's you know, the BBA approach, I think, is is one that really help customers be set up for that future success. 
And certainly I think it's important when, when customers are, are looking at implementing uh, these solutions that um, you know they look at the right partner from a services perspective too. Uh, yeah, exactly. And I just forgot about one example that really stood out in a recent project we did is uh, in the mining industry. There was a really complex manual job that the, uh, that the uh, engineers were working there, and there was a lot of manual data that they had to uh, work with. Mm -hmm. so we put in a place uh, a data conversion uh, project where we were automating the exchanges of data and putting it in a, in a centralized place. So process of getting everything together was around uh, maybe in terms of uh, two to three days to prepare this for analysis. And now it only takes like 10 to 15 minutes, okay? So there's also the aspect of the people doing this work, they can, be, they can have different tasks that are more value added, right? So within your organizations, you'll have people that are willing to work on things that are not mechanical, not repetitive. And, if we have uh, data systems that can do the job integration uh, much quicker and much more reliable, then, then these smart people can do different things that are more valuable. But I think too, you, know, you start to show people the data fast and show them the value of the data. Uh, yeah. Then they, they, they buy into the whole process more. I mean, they're, they're more willing to work with you to get data in to, to make sure that it stays, um, live and, this, and all the pieces stay alive because they, they see the value you've, you've now brought that data to the surface and um as before you know it's a three-day labor-intensive process and they probably never see the results and so they just do it because they're told to uh, exactly the and, mechanical and, things yeah and, and we really we want to get to is you know people do these tasks because they want to they see the value and and they benefit from it too and, and they're, they're going to be able to challenge the operations, right? Sometimes the insights that they'll get and they'll say, hey, what are you guys doing? You know, we have uh, these indications. And that's how they can also challenge the, uh, the other part, which is the operations. Mm -hmm. So you cannot improve. For example, if you're not gathering the information, you cannot improve. So you know, analyze, gather, analyze, and then learn from, your, uh, fr from the experiences you've done, right? Yeah. You know, it, it's an interesting kind of like an AI, AI model, right? So that's how it works. <laughs> exactly. Rerun simulation with these parameters. Mm -hmm. Yep. Some, sometimes we'll see a model where it actually integrates AI and IoT, and they call it an AIoT model. Uh, okay. Trying to add, merge that together. You know, as, as a part of, part of convergence, I guess you might uh, you might say, uh -huh. along with things like IoT convergence. I think, I think some marketing person had too much time on their hands, Craig, right. and they come up with another yeah. another acronym. Uh, yeah, right. There's no, there's no, there's no shortage of those. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's funny. One of the, one of the questions that we get a lot, and I, I'd say this is a little bit more from the the C level executive that's trying to justify some of these projects like data engineering, is they'll say to us, "Okay, right now, I don't have a demand problem for my product. I have a supply chain problem. I can't, regardless of what kind of automation solution I have." I, if I don't have material, I can't build anything. So therefore, does it, does it really matter? And one of the things that we're certainly trying to advise them is, is how important data engineering is, even to the visibility, to be able to not only see what's possibly coming and see what's not coming from your supply chain, but the ability to kind of make changes sometimes on the fly to your manufacturing process, because now you're dealing with a, a different supplier or some, some different raw material. So one of the things I think our listeners are going to want to hear is that if they, if they get that question, which is, does it matter for us to invest in a data engineering solution if right now our only problem is I can't, I can't build enough of what, I'm, what we're selling and our backlog is huge, is what's the kind of the justification that they can use to say why it's still important to invest in data engineering? And can that add any value to helping them with their ultimate problem now is how am I going to get material and how am I going to to, to, to re-engineer products so I can make it based on with the raw material I'm able to procure. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, definitely an interesting one because it, a lot of customers are facing that. But if, for example, they would have been able to put in place um, smarter analytics on the, the, the plug on the market 
and we use it in an in a AI perspective to anticipate the mm -hmm. conditions of the market and the suppliers, that's something that's going to raise the flags already. So I think being able to put in place a system or a group of systems that are going to gather the information on the outside world, so nothing to do with your uh, operation within your plan, but the yeah. outside world. And there are tools available for that. There are APIs, there are REST services that you can subscribe to and get the different markets uh, um, provisions and predictions. So I think that would be something to consider to implement at the yeah. stages of the project. Yeah, what do you say, Kevin, as far as other ways you're able to kind of help you know, sell data park is when you get when you're hearing that same argument to help them really uh, solve that the whole, you know, at least contribute to trying to solve the supply chain issue. Yeah, you know, the, the, the ROI question is always the hard one. Um, there's never um, real clear answers since we're not just, you know, putting in a, a more efficient motor mm -hmm. that has a, you know, a real definitive ROI. But I think in this case, you know, kind of what, what Bron Franco's mentioning is it's still a visibility problem yep. and, and creating visibility to the data that, that you have on the supply chain is important. Um, because it, you know, it still is important for your operations. And I, I think even on the operational side, kind of what you're alluding to, Craig, is that you're still gonna have some operational challenges because you're gonna you're gonna try to make that product for your customer any way you can. Absolutely. And maybe you're used to getting it from this supplier um, and you switch suppliers. Well, the runability on your production line could be very different. Um, and so having having the, the ability to give those kind of those operational analytics, which you know, data engineering is you know the step one, but ultimately what we're trying to do is provide you know, operational analytics to make our, our, our plant run better. Uh, that's still going to be a challenge uh, in the supply chain world because you're going to get creative. You're going to have you know you have different suppliers. Maybe you're going to try an alternate um, raw material that you've never tried before, and you know and you need to be able to look at how operations run with that. So. Uh, there's there's probably more challenges on the operation when you have supply chain problems because of uh, what you are you know, bringing in the, the front end of the plant. So yeah, I, I just kind of you know try to get them focused on that you know that side of things, and um, and they just have to you know it's really these are strategic projects uh, that, that benefit the plant in the long run because um, you know we. Uh, you know, the, the, the companies that were ready for this when COVID hit certainly benefited from being able to have their remote workforce, you know, working from day one. Uh, you know, how many, uh, how many, you know, firewall companies had their best year ever in, in, uh, in 2000 VPN sales <laughs> because, yeah, you know, absolutely. everyone's scrambling. Uh, so, um, I, I just, you know, point to the, you know, there, there's still operational challenges and, um, and, and value. Or maybe yeah. just reducing the waste. Maybe they are, um, the yeah, materials yeah. That they have in hand, they are uh, wasting them. So, right? So mm -hmm. the time now where the waste has to be like brought down to very low levels to make sure not to waste that because we can't get it because of the supply chain issues. And in, you need to have systems in place to measure waste they want, mm -hmm. right? So quality is the key. But the, the waste that you generate uh, needs to be accounted in systems. Uh, people, the operators need to have some kind of trends or reports, KPI dashboards for them to get uh, aware of the situation of the waste. So they will work uh, closer with the, with the machinery and the operations to keep that down. So I think maybe that could be part of something that we control, uh, just something we don't control. So Yeah, yeah. But one of the things that's critical is you know, the next discussion we're having after supply chain, it's all about operational resilience. It's all about sustainability, you know, per your point about trying to conserve, do a better job of conserving resources. You know, the whole discussion certainly changed about energy when, when oil was, you know, $30 a barrel instead of $100 a barrel mm -hmm. with an infinite supply versus certainly with, the, you know, with geopolitical issues as far as seeing some of that supply, you know, possibly get disrupted. So one of the things that people are looking for on their solutions are, are things that help their sustainability and operational resilience and, and you know, energy cons, you know, conservation. So make, make them also into something that, that, that's really, and so the ROI is really based on a sustainability 
and it, which is obviously harder to measure, but they recognize that it's like insurance. It's, it's like an insurance policy. It's like when we were putting in all having advising people to put in all those remote licenses for working at home. And then when the plants began, when the, when the, when the, when the lockdowns ended and people started going to the plants, it was like, well, what are we going to do with these remote licenses now? And then we're like, you should probably need to still keep them because of the fact that you never know what's going to happen. And we've been going through this with some of our clients in China. And as they, as they went into lockdown, how do they continue to maintain operations when they can't get personnel into the plant or with social spacing, they can't get the same number of personnel in the plant. Mm -hmm. So it's, Correct, it's, it's yeah. this whole new normal of being able to do remote operations and make sure you have those tools available uh, to, to have that because that's part of anybody's operational resilience and, and sustainability, um, you know, you know, objectives. Yeah. Great. And any, uh, again, if you can, you need to put systems to measure. So the data will come in, but you need to contextualize it. Yep. It could be another closing point is to, uh, to make sure that your environmental data is sustainable, that you have um, targets, right? And in order to you need to measure yourself versus the target that you're getting, plus all the government um, requirements that are going to be stricter and stricter on the emissions, especially around the, the metal and mining industry that we work on, the, uh, the biofuels. So those, uh, those industries are becoming more stricter. And there is a lot of um, data that needs to be uh, extracted to provide proof, yeah, that we're good at that. Uh, absolutely. You know, I'd say if I have a final question, it's really, you know, we always like to, pe people always like the Monday morning quarterback question, which is <laughs> yeah. for the people who, for the, for the people who have, um, you know, for the, for all the projects that you've been involved with, that there are things that you'd recommend that you, your customers say, boy, I wish I did something different. I wish I learned from, you know, if I, if I did this project a second time, I would have planned it differently. I would have implemented something differently. So from each of you, what, what would you say if you had a, you had to raise a, a Monday morning quarterback point for everybody to think about saying that when you're, when you're doing this project, think about this first, because you'll, you may regret not doing it later. I could go first. <laughs> I could go first and last. <laughs> uh, so for me, I think it's defining the business requirements. Okay. Maybe on that Monday, you'll say, okay, I'm going to do this the right way. I'm going to put the right people on and let's put those requirements on the paper, what they look like. And we're going to run with that. Because if somebody questions us and say, why are you guys doing it like this? You should be doing it like this. Well, you can take out your requirements you built in with your team and this is solid. So this is your game plan and you're running with that. So I think I, think I would do that on a Monday morning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I I think along that theme, Franco, for us, a lot of times where projects could have gone better is it comes down to the people uh, and making sure that we have the right people in the project in the beginning so that, you know, so that one, it goes really efficient um, and two people feel part of the, the solution. Because you're definitely going to get more buy-in when people are, are part yeah. of the project. Um, and, and so I think, you know, taking a step, you know, I like that the idea of that kind of racy diagram where you, you do put the responsibilities and you've got the right people the on board in, in the beginning of the project. Uh, um, so I, I think that's, that's always, and I think I, always guys, one, it can be done a little better. And, and also I think what you guys do good, Kevin, is you do a lot of uh, education and training as well on the yeah. on your suite of, um, on your suite of applications. You don't let the customers down and, Definitely, that's something you coached us as well when we started the, uh, the integration with you. Uh, so I think that's also important is to get that training in and the willingness to participate. So I think that's uh, that's a key for success as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's that's true. And, and I'll tell you, though, the one thing I've certainly learned doing projects with ARC is the earlier you get engagement and buy-in, you know, where, where people feel they're part of the process and have an ownership stake and they feel they have an ownership stake and they feel as though they have a, they, they, they own a piece of that success and they want it to be successful. If it's one of those things that the sea levels have gotten together and they've decided we're going to do this and we'll tell you about it when we're ready, 
the whole culture issue just makes it yeah. a, an abysmal failure. Yeah. If people are brought in from the beginning where, where it's like, we, we want your opinion, we want your input, we respect it. And we're going to, and that's going to be something that's going to help us de deploy this and make this successful. It makes a 180 degree difference between a successful project and a, and a non-successful project. So, I mean, that, that would certainly be my Monday morning quarterback yeah. for, for these, for data engineering or any project within the plant. But uh, all I can say is uh, Bronco and Kevin, you guys were great today. It was an Thank excellent you. discussion. I really, 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 really appreciate it. Uh, as we wrap up, there's going to be a one question, uh, kind of a post webinar survey, which is going to, which you'll see on the screen when you log out, which is how confident are you in the success of your next uh, industrial uh, analytics and digital transformation uh, initiative? We're going to, the choices will be not very confident, uh, somewhat confident, uh, mostly confident, and very confident. And uh, <laughs> if we probably, we, we, we won't answer this one in advance, but, uh, but I, we, I probably have my own. Uh, uh, ways that I would I would see a lot of my a lot of the ARC clients answering it. I'm sure Bronco yeah. and Kevin, you probably do as well. But uh, feel free to contact me or Kevin uh, anytime for maybe a small question. Uh, we're always uh, there to help. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, we can always help. And having been through this, uh, you know, Franco probably uh, as much as anybody. Uh, let us know how we can help. Excellent. Well, again, thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Bronco. And a thank you to all our listeners. This is Craig Resnick with the ARC Advisory Group. Thanks very much for listening and have a wonderful day. Thanks, Take care, everyone. Yeah. Bye now. Bye.